Hello and welcome to Politics War Room with James Carville and I'm Al Hunt. This week we are joined by Congresswoman Liz Cheney of Wyoming. Remember, we take your questions each episode, so write into politicswarroom at gmail.com or send a tweet to at Politicon for next week's show. We'll get to as many as we can, and don't forget to tell us where you're from. And please check out the link to this week's sponsor, Raycon, in the show notes. We thank you for supporting the sponsors. It makes this show happen. Please tell your friends about us and remind them to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast. James, uh, every week uh, we are talking uh, about uh, the efforts of Democrats to finally get some kind of social uh, infrastructure bill through and the tight Virginia governor's race. This is the same week. Uh, this is, we have to do it again because those are the big stories after, after the January 6th conversation we've had with Liz Cheney. Um, I feel, again, cautiously optimistic about Congress, although I'm really upset on the tax front. Uh, I think it is inexcusable that Cinema and some others, and even Joe Manchin here, are resisting what are really perfectly rational and good tax uh, increases to offset the awful Trump tax cut of 17. And I'm worried that now they're trying to turn to this billionaire's tax. James, you and I would not be affected by the billionaire's tax, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, I worry that it's not. It's going to be difficult to enforce. It's going to not be workable. It could have legal problems. And the idea of returning the rates to what they were pre-17, is, it, which probably would affect us, is a very good idea. So I'm, I'm again, to repeat, cautiously optimistic, but uh, some of the stuff up there I don't like. Well, let, let's start. All of our time in political consulting, when I was af- active, it, it was always required on politicians to do tough things. I, I Reagan had to do the Panama Canal Treaty. I, I mean, I'm sorry, Jimmy Carter had to do the Panama Canal Treaty. You know, Reagan had to do the Saudi uh, AWACS, I forgot what it was. It had, you know, fierce opposition from the pro-Israel lobby. It, 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 and it was a matter of faith. It, to, you had to be for cuts in entitlement programs. If not, you, you, that was like being for segregation if you didn't want to cut entitlement programs. I mean, my God, we had to put a five cent increase in the gas tax in 1993 because no one would take you seriously if you didn't have some pain to the middle class. All right. That, that was just what it was. Uh, same thing was true with affirmative action or, or any number of things. Even even now, this is in addition to being good policy, this is enormously popular. No one is asking you to walk a plank to be for something that the public will rebel against. The public actually likes the idea of taxing the, not just billionaires, but millionaires, uh, over 400,000. So this is what drives me crazy. But the, the point about the billionaires tax, it will get overturned in the Supreme Court. But at least it will pass some kind of muster to having programs funded. And once you once you pass that, you, you even if it gets overturned, I think you're good by by, by the congressional rules. But yeah, it, yeah it's a right. terrible it's a terrible idea. It's not this this there's no way this court this court is is, is in in total service to billionaires as if they would let something like this stand. That's all that that Brett Kavanaugh, or Neil Gorsuch, or any of them care about. Is protecting wealth, so it's it it'll get overturned. It's it's a terrible idea, it, but the the real thing is to raise taxes on people making over a half million dollars a year, which it has every is not just the right thing to, to do policy wise. It's politically brilliant. Well, again, if we go back to that, those tax rates that were in effect prior to that Trump tax cuts, the economy was humming. I mean, you know, 19, 2014 to 17, we had more economic growth than we did under Trump. The unemployment rate dropped by 33 uh, percent. And to take that up to, to a 39.5 percent rate, 39.6 percent rate, it just makes sense. They ought to do something on capital gains. They ought to raise the corporate tax rate. We are taxed less than almost every one of the major industrial countries in the world. Let me say it again. America is taxed less. We are not overtaxed. And I love the idea of Elon Musk 
having to pay a lot more taxes. But you're right. The billionaire's tax is just, it's, an in a, it's really an ineffective way to go. But if it gets them through, which I'm not sure it will, uh, go for it. So yeah, we remember when we got to 39.6, right, was in 1993. As I recall, the economy in the United States was pretty good from 1993 through 2001. <laughs> it wasn't pretty good. It was the best economy we had since World War II. Yeah, it was. And it was also good in the two or three years before Trump. You know, as we yeah, said last week, Trump, Trump right. landed on third base and he, you know, claimed right. he hit a triple. He didn't. Right. No, uh, it, it, uh, I, I there was disab- more GDP growth and more jobs created the last two years of the Obama administration than the first two of the Trump administration. Absolutely. And, I, you know, I'll tell you one thing again. I have pretty much defended Joe Manchin in the sense he represents West Virginia. I cannot understand why he is killing this provision to make <laughs> banks really? report more income. I mean, this, this doesn't well, now, have I'll to tell. do with coal. This has to do with simple, there are tax cheaters out there, and all they're saying is report. No one's going to go and raid your files, and the IRS would probably collect billions and billions more, and Joe Biden doesn't need that in West Virginia. Or Joe Manchin, so one day right? I'm going to tell you that the Stark is not real, how babies come. It's the lobbyists. It's of the, course it that's is. That's where this comes from. The same reason we is. can't negotiate prices for prescription drugs. Right. So it's just exactly what it is. Because it's, it's highly popular. If this bill passes, scaled down as it is, it'll still be a, it, the most significant social legislation that has been passed in, I don't know, 50 years maybe. Uh, it'll, be, it'll help a whole lot of people, no matter what they take out. And the other winner, the other winner will be K Street, because they have managed to water it down, and there are a whole bunch of them, including a bunch of former Democrats. But speaking of Democrats, James, your latest update on Virginia. All right, so I, if obviously... I, I, People have appropriately been in a panic mode. I think Terry's campaign was right <laughs> to sound the alarm. Uh, the, the, the history is at con- political history is at conflict. Most of the time, in, in the last 44 years, I think, the party that has taken power in the White House loses the Virginia governor's race. And it, it, it always comes to a year after the presidential election. Terry was the exception. Uh, and, and generally, the, the, the outside party closes better than the in-power party. And the Democrats have had total power in Virginia uh, at, at least since 2019 when they took over the state house. They have both senators and have had the governor for, for a good length of time. And you're always smart in that instance in a, in a tie race betting on, on, on the out party. But there's another rule is, is that campaign which closes better in a close election generally wins. I mean, Terry's close has been significantly better than Yunkin. He is in a prevent defense. They're talking about Tony Morrison, uh, uh, some nonsense uh, in you know, critical race theory, and somebody banning our book. Yeah, yeah banning David, uh, David, David Wasserman texted me a, a tweet by, by someone who says, does he realize that Tony Morrison is more popular in Northern Virginia than any politician? <laughs> I, I think it's, a, it's an absurd close. I, I guess they think it's going to work. The people that are running this campaign are, are, are pretty shrewd people. But Terry's close, that the crowds, uh, the, the, the early vote numbers in Democratic strongholds have gone from being pretty good to all, uh, borderline impressive so i that's what you are you can take the take the pick what counts more being on the out party when the ends in that counts for something or having a better close which counts for something so that that that's the two conflicting things that i see here i i i'll say this right now if we had any other candidate other than terry and, and you got to take out mark warren and tim kane because they said in census we'd have lost that race by seven and a half points well, I'll tell you this. Uh, just uh, we talked about this yesterday, James, on the phone. Imagine the headline on November three. Two possible headlines. Number one, Yunkin wins in Virginia. Uh, I mean, there is a a massive depression in the Democratic Party. The other one is McAuliffe wins. At which point, okay, we dodged that bullet. Uh, now we got a shot. We've got to start building for twenty twenty two. Huge difference. Even a point. Yeah, but the difference, I think, more than anything else, is what I call R&R, retirements and recruitment. 
It's going to be hard to recruit good Democratic candidates if Terry loses for 2022 because people will say, gee, we couldn't win Virginia. How am I going to win this congressional seat? However, if he wins and they get a deal, and make no mistake about it, 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 it as Roger Altman and literally every person with, with a brain says, this economy is good. I mean, uh, you know, and of course, all, all the Democrats want to do is talk about inflation. Well, we had low inflation for this century. It, it hadn't been very good all, for workers. All, 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 all the Republicans want to do. Right, yeah. Oh, no, no. A lot of the press or the Democrats. Oh, but inflation. Oh, it, 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 okay, so we got a little inflation. Uh, well, guess what? Workers have leverage like they've never had before. Why as Democrats are we not happy about that? I don't understand it. I really don't. And, and the household savings, and as Roger points out, the quit rate, people are quitting jobs left and right, and that tells you one simple thing. You quit a job when you know you can get another one. The, the, the operative piece of music for this era in America is take this job and shove it. All right, that's the way workers feel, and I'm glad for workers. Yeah, I agree, um, and, and I think uh, if they get – you win Virginia, Democrats win Virginia – they get some kind of a deal, you know, 1.7, 1.8. I don't know what the number is, but most of the good stuff in. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it really is uh, It's the particulars that matter a lot more than the numbers. I, I, yeah, and I think we should not discuss the number. We should talk about what's in it, but that's, you, you, you agree with that also. Oh, I do. Hey, James, uh, this is a subject we know very little about. Uh, I, uh, that's Facebook. Uh, years ago, an assistant signed me up on Facebook. I never use it. I used to think on balance is probably more good. People communicate. I'm now convinced after these leaks have come out and these testimony that Facebook does a lot more harm than it does good, particularly in other countries around the world. But I think they enabled uh, the Trump people in 2016. They enabled some terrible, uh, you know, uh, hate uh, speech in the Middle East, and I, they do it all in the name of profit, and I think they have to be reined in. You know, I, 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 I don't even have it. Allie's not even signed me up for it because I wouldn't know how to use it. I don't yeah, know shit about it. I, I, and it, it's become a, a cause, a crusade. The, the thing that I would point out is these people are seeking bad information. They look for it. And I, maybe it'll help if you curb Facebook some kind of way, I have no idea, but they'll just go somewhere else. They, they'll look, they'll, they, these people are so goddamn stupid, they're looking for stupid information to buttress their stupid views. And, well, James, I, James, let me, let me to descend. I'm quoting from the Atlantic, a, a terrific Atlantic piece. They played a big role in organizing January 6th. They were all over the place in every state and everything. You couldn't do that by telephone. Uh, you really couldn't. And, and some of that should have been checked by Facebook, and they didn't. I, 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 I guess, but my point is they would do it through TikTok or Instagram. I, I, I don't well, know any of this shit. Instagram right? is Facebook. Yeah, people are looking, when people are looking for, when stupid people are looking for things to support their stupidity, you can't stop them. And I, 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 and I don't have any problem. I don't have any Facebook stock. I don't have uh, Facebook on my thing. I, 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 uh, I, obviously, I know Sheryl Sandberg. I don't know Mark Zuckerberg. I, I, I have no idea. I even know how it works. But my, my point is, is you, you can do something about Facebook, but you can't do anything about stupidity. It will seek its own level. But uh, I'm all for it because, well, Atlantic is for it, so I, I, absolutely. And the Times yeah. is for it, so it's got to be a good idea. Well, read, I, that, I, read that Atlantic I, piece. I, I, it's pretty, it's pretty, I, actually, a whole bunch of pieces. Uh, and our old friend right. Bill Burton put together this consortium, which, right. the likes of which right. I've never quite seen before. I, but my, my, my general rule, if everybody is for something, it generally turns out to be a bad idea. But well, I'll tell you who's not I'll for be it. open to it. Donald Trump and the haters are not for it, so, um, you know, uh, we don't want to be with them. Trump, okay. will, Trump will start his own thing so he can make money. He doesn't like Facebook making money when he can make money. That ain't we'll see how that goes. Okay, uh, I hope they do something about it, but we may or may not return to that subject. Hey, James, as you know, Liz Cheney had future written all over her. Speaker of the House, maybe a Republican president, smart, well-connected, solidly principled conservative. Then she stood up to Donald Trump about the January 6th mob assault in the Capitol and the claims he won the November election. 
She was stripped of her House leadership role, and a Trump-backed candidate has challenged her, her re-election. Most importantly, she is the vice chair of the special committee investigating the January 6th violence. Congresswoman, we really appreciate you joining two old semi-lefties today uh, for this conversation. Uh, let, me, uh, let me just tell us, tell us where you are uh, with the committee investigation, how it's going with you and Chairman Thompson, and any timetable ahead. Well, thanks very much, uh, Al. It's it's great to be here with you and James. Uh, and uh, I particularly appreciate your describing me as uh, the past tense in your intro. So, thanks very much. I, 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 I did. <laughs> Unintended. Um, no, it's it's great to be with you guys. Um, you know, we are in the process of really. First of all, um, working in a way that I think is unprecedented uh, in terms of certainly recent history in the House, and that is uh, in a almost totally nonpartisan basis. It's not even bipartisan. It, you know, the committee works together as one. The Democratic members, the Republican members, the staff is one staff, um, and and I think it's it's. You know the the gravity of the of the issues with which we're dealing is is very significant, obviously, um, but it's also very refreshing to be doing it in a way that you know we're working together as Americans, and not you know sniping at each other uh, in the hearings, um, but really focused on getting to the bottom of of the details and the specifics of what happened, uh, and making sure the American people. Um, have the information that they deserve to have about what led to the attack on the Capitol and uh, and who who caused uh, the specifics of it and the details of it and what happened every moment of the day. Well, uh, Trump and Bannon, uh, as you well know, are resisting everything, hoping to run out the clock. But there was a whole war room uh, at the Willard Hotel and elsewhere planning a coup to overturn the election and tie it into the January 6th mob assault. Can you tell us, are you getting cooperation from any of those other uh, uh, coup members, any of those other conspirators who were participating in that act? Well, uh, yes, we are. First of all, you know, I wouldn't um, jump to describe it the way that, that you, you did necessarily. And I think it's important for us to get to the facts. Um, I think that if you look at uh, what happened between the election and January 6th, it's very clear that there was an effort underway, and this is why I voted to impeach the president, um, but that there was an effort underway uh, to overturn the results of the election and to ignore the rulings of the courts uh, and to go through a whole process that you know we're beginning to get the details of in terms of things like uh, John Eastman's memo um, the suggestions and the pressure on Vice President Pence and on local officials to overturn the election, to change the, to, to reject the slates of electors that they had approved and to try to put in place new slates. So there clearly was a large effort underway. We are getting additional information uh, and talking to people who were involved. Um, there are a number of people who are coming forward voluntarily, uh, others that we have issued subpoenas uh, to. Uh, and, um, you know, some who are responding to those subpoenas in ways that um, that reflect a recognition that, you know, it's people's patriotic duty to come forward and, and tell what they know about the events that led to the attack on the Capitol. There are also reports, Congresswoman, that some of your House colleagues may have worked with the uh, people who engaged in the January 6th assault. Um, could you call them to testify and subpoena uh, them uh, if necessary? We will absolutely um, be uh, ensuring that we get the testimony of anybody who's got uh, relevant information, and that includes members of Congress. Um, we've talked to uh, a number of people already, um, some uh, people on the Hill, including staff, um, and will continue to do so. And again, in some cases, and I would hope in every case, people would come forward. I mean, this we have to be really conscious, I think, of not letting this devolve into, into, into partisanship. And um, there have been too many efforts already uh, by Republicans, by members of my party, uh, to attempt to delay, uh, to attempt to thwart, to attempt, um, in some cases, to obstruct 
uh, the investigation, and and I think we've got to make sure um, that that we don't put up with that, and that we encourage people who've got information to come forward. And our preference is certainly that they do that voluntarily. Okay. So, so, Congressman, uh, you're, you're the House leader, Republican leader Kevin McCarthy, and the Whip, uh, who I could live right close to the district I used to live in, it know him quite well. Steve Scalise have said, well, we should have a bipartisan committee look into this. Is there a flaw in that argument? Because I think there is. <laughs> well, of course. I mean, look, we started out with the idea. If you look at what uh, Kevin McCarthy said on January 13th on the floor of the House, he called for a commission to look into this. And then he um, instructed uh, John Katko, the ranking member of the Homeland Security Committee, to negotiate with Benny Thompson, the Democrats, to come up with a bipartisan commission and was modeled very much after the 9-11 commission. Um, you know, equal numbers of members, Democrats and Republicans, not currently serving uh, subpoena power that would require the agreement of both parties. The Democrats essentially took every proposal that we made and they agreed to it and the negotiation was done and at the end of it Kevin McCarthy decided that he didn't he didn't actually want a commission and so he lobbied against it in the house he lobbied against it in the senate he had 35 republicans vote for it in the house uh which which is good I'm glad that that happened uh and it passed the house but the republicans defeated it in the senate so for the republican leadership now to be suggesting that you know somehow they won't participate because they need to have a bipartisan commission. Everybody needs to remember that, that they're the ones that killed the bipartisan commission. So if there were a secret vote, right, they didn't have to vote publicly. And I, I believe you have like 213 members of your House caucus, or roughly that. If, if it was a secret, you got 35 in a public vote. How many would you have gotten in a secret vote? Oh, a vast majority. Vast majority. Well, well over uh, 100. Yeah. Yes, no doubt. Okay. Um, because yeah. they, the vast majority of the members of the House Republican Conference know the election wasn't stolen. Um, they know that, you know, the phone call that Donald Trump made two or three days before the 6th to the Georgia election officials, which there's a recording of, that phone call itself um, was likely an impeachable offense. Um, a president calling a local official saying, find me votes. Um, you know, that those though they they know that what Donald Trump did is is fundamentally dangerous and what he continues to do is dangerous. And if there had been a secret vote, you would have gotten the vast majority of Republicans. So on it. when I, I'm not a barely a lawyer and hardly an expert on congressional investigations, but. There's always this kind of conflict between an ongoing investigation by the Department of Justice and an ongoing investigation by a congressional committee. Is there any, I don't want to say collaboration, but are the members of this, this committee aware or, or that, you know, are they in contact with the Department of Justice is, is to not do things that might conflict with their investigation? How, how does that work? How, how does that, is it working in any kind of way or how does that work? Yeah, I mean, there's no there's no coordination, um, but you know we are very aware of the fact that there are criminal prosecutions going right. on. Um, right. Some of the people that have already been sentenced, and some of the people who are currently you know being prosecuted, um, are people that we've talked to. Uh, we've issued subpoenas to a number of them, um, so we are very aware that there's a criminal investigation going on. Our purpose. Is different. Our purpose is, you know, we have a legislative purpose, and that is to determine, um, you know, what happened and what legislative changes might be needed to help prevent this in the in the future. And so, you know, even though the Department of Justice has got a criminal investigation underway, um, their investigation does not extend to things like um, if the President of the United States fails to uh, send assistance fails to do his duty to defend the Capitol, for example, when it's under attack, um, as, as President Trump did. Um, that's clearly a dereliction of duty. Uh, are there additional criminal penalties, for example, that, that are necessary um, to help enhance um, the criminal law with respect to something like that? Um, we're looking at 
1887 Electoral Count Act and whether or not we need to make uh, amendments to that in order to ensure that, um, you know, in the future, um, this kind of objection to electors um, isn't uh, so so subject to potential abuse. Um, so there are things like that that are specifically a legislative purpose, and those guide us. Um, you know, we clearly have oversight authority in terms of getting to the bottom of what happened with this attack um, on the Capitol. But it was also an attack on the Constitution and an attack on the, the constitutional process. And so those, those things uh, also are part of, of, uh, of our agenda and our purpose. I'm we sorry. may well be in a position where uh, we are um, you know, uh, issuing criminal referrals. That could well be part of our final, uh, our final report. So they're, they're linked and connected. Um, but but there are different different branches of government, different a- areas of responsibility. So I, I, t- I, I take it that if you you sense or, or, or the committee senses that there's potential criminal exposure, that you will make referrals to the Department of Justice. Absolutely. Uh, all right, Alan, give me one more, and I'll come back with another one. Yeah, um, Congresswoman, uh, we mentioned Kevin McCarthy earlier. He he is really going all out uh, after you. He's had one of his lackeys tell Republican consultants that if they work for you, they won't have any other uh, uh, jobs. Uh, how is that going over in Wyoming? You know, look, I um, I, the people of Wyoming really couldn't care less <laughs> about sort of that inside the Beltway, Washington right. machinations. I I do think though that it raises real questions. It raises real questions when you have the leader of, a, of, of the Republican Party who is perfectly happy to help to support, to keep inside our tent members who are anti-Semitic, members who are racist, members who are white supremacist, clear bigots. Um, yet, uh, you know, he's, he's decided that he's gonna go after me apparently because, uh, you know, I believe we need to know the truth about the president, President Trump's responsibility, uh, the truth about what happened on January 6th on the attack on the Capitol. I think it tells you something about, um, about you know, the, the really um, dangerous situation the Republican Party is in today, that that's the choice that the leader in the House has made. Yep. Yeah, it does. And yet, you know, when I look around um, in House races, also Senate primaries, uh, you know, sometimes the debate in the Republican primary is who is more Trump? Uh, and uh, I thought he would, given everything, that he would he would not disappear, but, you know, it would it would be a diminishing asset. Uh, does it worry you that it's not? It does. And and I think that what it tells us is every elected Republican needs to realize that 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 we are not bystanders. And so those elected Republican leaders in Washington, for example, some have taken the path of Kevin McCarthy to embrace Trump. Others have decided they're just going to be silent. And the problem with the silence is that the lie then goes, um, you know, un, unobjected to, and the lie spreads, and people around the country begin to think, well, since no one or very few Republicans are standing up to say, no, this is not true, maybe it is true, and people, you know, Trump becomes a more viable alternative, and that is really dangerous. It's really dangerous for the country. Um, and, and so I think it's, it is incumbent upon every single elected official to stand up and say, look, you know, I, I'm a conservative Republican. I think Joe Biden's policies are really bad policies for the country. Um, and I think the American people deserve not to have to choose between the policies that we're seeing on the far left and insurrection. You know, the Republican Party has got to be a party that stands for ideals and principles. Um, and, and, and we've got to break out of the cult of personality uh, around Donald Trump. Well, the consequences for that go well beyond just the election. I know Michael Beschloss has said the country faces its most perilous threat from within since the Civil War. Uh, Robert Kagan, a neoconservative who I suspect you know well and have worked with, uh, has written that uh, due to Trump's actions, we may face street violence, a breakdown in civil society, and dividing the blue and red enclaves. I mean, that's a really pessimistic, and, and not more than pessimistic, that's a scary outlook about where we could be headed, Congresswoman. 
It is, and I I, um, I think that, that they're both right. Um, and again, I think that's something that leaders have a responsibility to address, not just sort of put, put their heads in the sand and, and hope for the best here and kind of whitewash what happened on January 6th. Because, you know, look, we, we, have, we have seen increasing violence um, we saw, look, the, the, the violence of the summer. Um, we saw, obviously, the political violence and the attack on the Capitol. Uh, we saw the um, uh, attack on the Capitol in Michigan, which happened before the attack on, on the U.S. Capitol. So, you know, I think um, we all have to step back from the brink and we have to take responsibility um, for uh, the circumstances that we're in. And we have to conduct ourselves in a way that's civil and serious and principled um, and and cannot embrace um, the violence, certainly, and, and also cannot embrace the fundamental efforts by Donald Trump to undermine our electoral process. You know, if you listen to what Donald Trump says about our elections, pretty much the same thing that the Chinese Communist Party says about, about our election system, that democracy doesn't work. Sure can't convey the will of the people. Um, and it, that's that's a recipe to fundamentally undermine uh, the democracy. So, Congresswoman, before this happened to you, you were known to me and to most people as being a kind of whip smart, uh, but with a pretty aggressive view of foreign policy. And you, you, you've said the magic word, China. So in closing, I want to go back to the Liz Cheney prior to January the 6th. And tell us what your critique is of Biden's China policy and what do you think our Ch China policy should be? I know you have a critique. It's like asking a football player would hurt. Something always hurts. So let's just close out and go back to that. <laughs> These January the 5th Liz Cheney that I've been knowing for the last 30 years. <laughs> Uh, well, <laughs> thanks, James. <laughs> um, yeah, look, I, I think China is uh, the biggest threat we face. I think that the the Biden China policy has a lot of elements to it that um, I think are misguided. Um, and I, I think if you look first of all, for example, at the defense budget, um, the extent to which the defense budget they proposed was insufficient. Um, we managed to plus it up in the House and the Senate. Uh, but but you've got a Chinese um, government that is doing things like testing hypersonic weapon systems, systems that threaten, you know, our homeland. They threaten our missile defenses. We don't have defenses to them. And you've got the, the Chinese military moving at a breathtaking pace to modernize. And we are nowhere close to doing that. So, number one, we need to have a lot more focus and attention on the reality of the threat the Chinese pose and, and how our military systems are being modernized to meet the threat. Um, number two, um, when you look at something like what uh, President Biden did in Afghanistan, uh, and it was a policy that President Trump started, uh, and it was wrong when President Trump did it, wrong when President Biden did it, but the way that President Biden pulled out of Afghanistan and the destruction that he left and the devastation to American allies um, people that had worked with us for decades, the message that that sends to the rest of the world and in particular to our adversaries is you can't count on America and China comes in to fill that void. And so if people around the world are sort of saying, should we cast our lot with America or with China, people don't want to have to cast their lot with China. Um, you know, fundamentally casting your lot with China means we're going to have a global surveillance state. We're going to live in that global surveillance state. It's not, it's not a world that's characterized by, you know, our values of freedom and liberty and uh, individual rights. So I think we have to, we've got to recognize that, that the Chinese have been at war with us across multiple fronts for decades now. And we need to conduct ourselves in a way that reflects we're going to stand up for our principles and our allies. It did not like what we saw with respect to the Biden administration waffling about Taiwan. Um, I think they, they need to recognize and understand um, the power politics at play and, and the need for strategic um, thinking about the future, uh, but making clear to the Chinese that we're going to defend our allies um, and, and uh, that the rest of the world knows they can 
they can count on us and that they ought to stand with us. Well, thank you very much, and I'm glad we could at least take some time to go back to the pre-16-2001 list, Janie. Thank you a lot. Thank you a lot. Did Mary tell you to do that? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Janie. Thank you. Okay, James, we got a bunch of good questions. Uh, most of them this time, actually all of them, uh, are from, from the continental U.S. Uh, usually we go overseas, so we'll be back overseas next week, I suspect. But Mike in Indianapolis uh, asks, he says, uh, he's, he's a, a, sounds like he's a Bernie Elizabeth Warren Democrat. He said, in 2020, Progressive Kara Eastman won the primary in Nebraska's second congressional district, a swing district. The former Democrat rep then endorsed the Republican. The same thing has happened, he says, in Buffalo, New York, where a, a, a left-winger progressive won the mayor, mayorality primary. James, uh, you and your guests frequently remark that progressives, Democrats, socialists don't win the races they run in, uh, except in solidly Democratic districts. But when establishment Democrats put their fingers on the scale against them, what should younger progressive candidates think about these older establishment Democratic Party members who undermine their rise? Well, uh, I, thank you for the question. And uh, I, in the overwhelming number of cases, and the most prominent being the presidential primaries of 2020, the Democratic Party was very clear in the direction it wanted to go in. It wanted, and I guess, I don't know, I guess I'm an establishment Democrat, whatever that means. Uh, Carville, Louisiana, LSU is an establishment. Okay, that's, that's fine. Uh, they have decided overwhelmingly. Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, everybody got a chance to run for president. And it seems to me that the, many of the insurgent Democrats don't respect Democratic voters. Because Democratic voters were very clear in the direction they wanted the party to go in. Even Democratic voters in New York City were very clear. Uh, you, you can have circumstances anywhere uh, where something happens, but I would tell my leftist friend that and I, I am not a moderate, I am a liberal, but I'm not a leftist. And liberal, the, the Democratic Party is very clear that it wants to go in a liberal direction, not a leftist direction, would be my answer. Um, James or Jimmy, as Tony Blair calls you, I would, uh, <laughs> I, I would, I would, too. I would concur. Um, and I think that that's the way Biden is governing. He's, he's governing as a liberal. There's some complaints that, you know, Elizabeth Warren uh, is able to tap some people or recommend people who are appointed to top jobs. Well, Elizabeth Warren is a faction of the party. I mean, she really is. She's not the dominant faction in the party, but if three or four treasury aides uh, or assistant secretaries uh, are Warren acolytes, that's as it should be. It is. It's a cliche, sure. but it is a big tent. But Biden is I, not governing as a left winger. He is governing as a liberal, a progressive a liberal. Real liberal. And, and Senator Warren is, is a significant uh, voice in, in, in the Democratic right. Party, and she, she should be, particularly on, on, on these matters, she's probably the smart, smartest person in the country on, on this kind of stuff, and somebody would be a fool not to listen to her. Absolutely. Jordan in Washington, D.C. We're going local now, James. I wonder right. if that's my old, old student, uh, uh, Jordan uh, Grossman. Here come he, he, he says he wants to – we want Manchin and Sinema to have less influence. The only way to fix it is to stop griping and elect more Democrats to the Senate. Same goes for the squad in the House. A real Democratic majority in both houses of Congress is the only way to break this outsized influence. But how can we change the narrative and get more Democratic-leaning voters focused and energized? Well, Jordan, first of all, you're absolutely right. If you're talking about the Senate, uh, I'll give you four, maybe even add a couple more answers. Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, North Carolina, and Ohio, all are states where Democrats could win next year in the Senate and would change the body significantly. And I wouldn't give up on Iowa. Chuck Grassley will be 95 when the term, when, when his term ends, if he's reelected. You know, he seems to drool a lot now and say silly things. So I don't think that's a lost cause. And I'll tell you, Missouri, which is a really red state, but they have that former uh, ethically, to put it mildly, challenged governor uh, to the right of Trump running. And don't forget that uh, Claire McCaskill and Joe Donnelly won when they ran against uh, crazy right people. So you you're right. Absolutely, Mike, or Jordan, rather. That's what you have to do. You have to focus on those races. Yeah, I, I would recommend a piece uh, in New York Magazine by Eric Levitz. Yep. 
uh, which definitely gives you the parameters of the internal argument in the Democratic Party. And I, I clearly come down on the side of uh, David Shaw. Uh, but but it, it's worth reading because I, I think it, it very much illustrates the, 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 the internal argument in the party. And I don't think it's really close as to who's right. Uh, I, I, I love the fact that David Shaw said it. He, of course, he did it as a client, and it became a thing that what Democrats should do is take polls, and when something is particularly popular, we should run on it. <laughs> I think that was been done before, but I'm, I'm glad that David did that. And he is, a, you know, by everybody's estimation, you know, one of, if not the sharpest data scientists in the party. James, I've never seen a business that tries to peddle products that are unpopular, and I've never seen a <laughs> news department that tries to run a whole lot of uh, uh, bad stories, so why should politicians? But you're absolutely right. Uh, yeah. So uh, we gave you an answer, Jordan. Craig in rural northern Michigan. That qualifies. I wish he would tell us a town, but it's, we, we know where it is. Yeah. He, he said he's surrounded by a sea of Trumpites, which I'm sure he is up there. He grew up a union household, proud member of operating engineers, local 324. But he's worried. Did Joe Biden uh, commit an unforced error by weighing in on the shipping crisis? I don't get that. But, James, what do you think? I, 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 I don't either. And, you know, we've been trying to get uh, a guest. And if uh, Secretary Gina has somebody listening, we'd love to get you on the show. I, I want to do a show on, on this whole supply chain issue because I, I, I read about it and I, I, I understand some of it. And, and I, I'll be honest with our our friend from rural northern Michigan, I, I, I don't, I'm not smart enough to know what Biden did wrong on the ship, wrong or right on the shipping crisis. I just not that that fluent in the in the in the issue. Well, I'm not either, James. But he said, you know, let's work 24 seven to get those um, uh, that that cargo unloaded. Those dock workers are unionized, uh, and the idea yeah. of more working hours, it seems to me, is actually. You know, pro union, but you know, again, right? We, I, I don't know. I mean, we, if, we got the another, if there's another, if you have a listener out there that knows this, send us a a, a, a question. In fact, don't send us a question. Send us an answer. Yeah, you know? Craig, <laughs> and, yeah, we'll Craig, Craig, right back, right back, and elaborate on your on your point. Um, we take it seriously. We just don't know. Yeah, exactly. Lack Elizabeth, of knowledge has never stopped me from commenting on anything. It's just complete lack of knowledge that. Is a little <laughs> that that would be a disqualifier a for the straight podcast, yeah. uh, James. Can't do that. <laughs> Elizabeth in Atlanta, Georgia, says, "Do you think Tim Ryan of Ohio would be a viable 2024 Democratic presidential candidate? I've seen some of his speeches on YouTube, and he seems like the type of person with appeal to both sides." Elizabeth. Focus on 2022. Get Tim Ryan elected to the Senate. Don't focus on 2024. If he gets elected to the Senate, uh, my guess is he's not ready to run for president. There'll be others who are. But 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 don't even mention the year 2024 and Tim Ryan in the same breath. 2022 and Tim Ryan. Okay, Elizabeth. Amen. 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 <laughs> and he and he's got a real shot out there, James. That he does. Repu he does. That, 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 that Republican just... primary out there, in in and to quote Jimmy Carville, is a shit show. I mean, it is Josh Mandel and J.D. Vance and this former woman who was or this not former woman. This woman was the former state chair, <laughs> uh, all arguing over who's who's the greater Trump supporter. So I think Tim Ryan, Ohio, certainly is tilted red, but he's got a real shot. You know, I, of all of J.D. Vance's, the, the, I, I mean, you got, all right, it, it's one thing to be like a squish. It, it's another thing to talk out of both sides of your mouth. It's another thing to flip flop. It's quite another thing to be the most blatant hypocrite to be running for public office in this entire cycle. And that, that's a high bar to clear. I think J.D. Vance does it. He wrote up. By most accounts, a kind of thoughtful book on the plight of the white working class in uh, southeastern Ohio. And, you know, he had critiques of liberals and et cetera, et cetera. And he just he went to like Yale or someplace like that. He, he, he might be he might be qualifying for Ivy League uh, Sphincter Hall of Fame. He's getting he's getting close. He, he, he's oh, doing good yeah. work. We have to put him under consideration, and now he's no total, question. a total Trump. But I am told by my friends in Ohio that the, the Trump people are, are not impressed with his flip-flop. And that Josh Mandel, he's, he's doubling down on crazy. 
I mean, he is he is literally lunatic in a tomb. And I, I think that's going to qualify him to win the Republican primary in, in Ohio. He is a really, really troubled bad guy. And yeah, he's just, right. right. He, he's 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 as crazy as J.D. Fance is opportunistic. <laughs> what a and primary. I, 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 well, that well, crazy. Crazy is going to beat opportunism every time. Well, that's that's why you got to feel that Tim Ryan's got a real shot. Mm -hmm. uh, there in the fall because he's basically there. There's some uh, left winger running against him, but he's basically uncontested. Um, right. James Robert in Seattle. This is a, you know right down your alley. We talk about this, but we can still keep talking about it because you're so good in it. The conventional wisdom is that the human infrastructure bill is suffering in the court of public opinion because it's been a debate about dollars instead of about clearly understandable uh, understandable benefits that people will be able to see in their daily lives. Why? Why? Robert asked you, James, is it so difficult <laughs> for Democrats in the White House to make the case loudly for the mountaintops every hour of the day? Uh so, first of all, human infrastructure is a word that should – I'm for total free speech, but if we pass the law banning the phrase human infrastructure <laughs> I or reconciliation, I think I would support it. Look, let me give you one thing on human infrastructure. that We, are. we, we, we do have a, a, a labor shortage in this country. And there are a lot of reasons. In, in, in some ways, this is not a bad thing at all. Workers have more leverage than they ever had. We have women that are dropping out of the workforce because if you tell a woman you've got to choose between your job and your child, they're going to, most women are going to choose their child. This daycare, this federally funded daycare across this country is a winner on every level. First of all, it would put more people in the workforce, more people earning, more people paying payroll taxes, Social Security, Medicare, more people paying sales taxes, et cetera, et cetera. We now know it was some debate for a period of time. It is no longer a debate. These programs help. They help in the development of these children. They have better social outcomes, better mental outcomes. They're less likely to get sick. They're less likely to commit crimes. And this is not a, a program that costs anything. The, the payoff to society, to to in, employers, to the tax base, to outcomes is a hundred percent guaranteed to be good. And I, 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 why Walmart and Target and Amazon and everybody else is not beating the drums on this? I, I, I don't know. I, and I hope that the White House is really aggressive. Point is, this is one of many things that we use the, the, the H-I word that I'm not going to use anymore because I've, I've banned it from the English language. But that he is exactly right, and that's the kind of stuff that gets me on fire that we need to talk about. Yeah, uh, I agree. Mitch McConnell said the other day that uh, the public doesn't want this stuff. Uh, I want Mitch McConnell to tell us the public doesn't want universal pre-K. I want Mitch McConnell to tell us the public does not want an expanded child tax care credit. I want Mitch McConnell to tell us the public does not want Medicare to negotiate lower prescription drug prices. Of course the public wants that. And what McConnell, the reason McConnell has been able to get away with that so far is exactly uh, what, the, uh, what the listener wrote in. Uh, they keep talking about the size. And I, I, I think it's changing, and I think if it's enacted, which I believe it will be, every district ought to talk about what this will mean for people in your district because there are very few yeah, that right. won't be significantly enhanced. I, I suspect there are Republican legislators in Oklahoma and West Virginia, and they have universal pre-K. They do. <laughs> Yeah, I hard to think of Oklahoma is, is being, you know, Seattle. <laughs> it's not the it's not the People's Republic of Oklahoma. Uh, no, no, that's no. for sure. No. No. Um, uh, speaking of West Virginia, John in Chicago and William in Sandpoint, Idaho. I'm going to combine these questions. Uh -huh. John wants to know uh, or suggest the DNC needs to find a laid, a laid off West Virginia coal miner and run him in a primary against Joe Manchin. And William in Sandpoint said, uh, why isn't Biden's team, instead of being all over, you know, why aren't they all over West Virginia like a cheap suit saying some version of, hey, this is what you get there? You know something? Joe Biden is the best you're ever going to get if you're a Democrat from West Virginia. If you want to tilt at windmills, you get some retired coal miner, out-of-work coal miner to run against him. It ain't going to matter. Uh, I, I'm disappointed in some of his positions, uh, but I think he's doing better than anybody else would do from there. I think he'll end up supporting a bill in the end, 
And, and I also think that he's probably going to be end up uh, supporting the Voting Rights Act and breaking it with a with a with a filibuster change. Uh, and, I, and I and I want to tell you, John and William, if you can figure out someone better in West, West Virginia, tell us. I don't think you can. Right. I, I think in your earlier thing, you, were, you meant to say Joe Manchin, and you said Joe Biden. Did I? I, I? I'm I, sorry. I, 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 I get, I get my yeah. Joes. I get my Joes. Know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so look. Senator Manchin is a Roman Catholic Italian Democrat running in a state that is not, the Democrats have not carried a county since 2008. The choice is not Joe Manchin or a, a retired union progressive coal miner. The choice is Joe Manchin or Marsha Blackman. All Black, right? Blackburn. 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 That's the choice. We were right. both we seem to be stumbling on names here today, but that's okay. <laughs> and, and so we don't need to be primary in anybody, okay? And A, you know, it's not going to work. And B, it's, it's, it's just not a smart thing to do. So, But I, I understand our, our listeners' passion. I thank them for their communications. But I hope that after hearing this, you will reconsider your position. Amen. Cindy in Berwick, Pennsylvania. James, she says she watches MSNBC and other liberal news sources, and all they do is tell us they continue to condemn two Democratic senators instead of 50 Republicans. Cindy thinks the media is sinking us. No wonder Biden's polls. Does anyone realize that we're in a blink away from losing democracy? It's a damn good question. And, and it, it, it just, it, you know, you and I talk about this all the time. The, the media, the liberal media, whatever it is, okay, they love to criticize Democrats. I, I'm not against criticizing Democrats. I've done it on, on any number of occasions. But the idea that it's, it's this both siderism, but yeah, well, you got some, you know, James, <laughs> okay, there's some crazy Republicans out there, but, but you got to admit there's some, some crazy Democrats. Well, okay, there's some, not very many, and they're not nearly as crazy as these Republicans. And, and the New York Times this week did a story that said it is the ultimate in both sides. I mean, I, I, you, know, you know, I have complicated views on the time. I have some really good views about them. It wrote a story said both candidates are running away from the national leaders. Uh, you know, of course, Yonkin doesn't want to We're have talking any, about Virginia, talk about right. Trump, but, uh, Virginia, yeah, don't talk about Trump. But, you know, McCall doesn't talk about Biden, but he's having Biden come in and do an event for it. God damn, I've run a lot of campaigns. If some of you do an event with somebody, you're not running away from them. And I don't think it was this reporter. I just think the New York Times editors are so politically stupid and such jackasses, they order these jackass stories. And I don't think any of any. I, I, I'd love to know if there's a single political editor there that has ever been around a campaign. Because it doesn't seem like it is to me. Well, I, I won't defend... Uh, everything, but I will defend the New York Times. I think MSNBC is a far greater culprit than that. But you know, your 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 point is still. Look, I, I, I still think Tyler Kepler is the base, best baseball writer that there is. So I, I will defend the Times. I, I will not defend this idiotic both siderism that they engage in. Okay, keep those questions coming in because we really are good and a couple of you uh we weren't quite sure i think it was craig so send us another uh, another email uh, and let us know uh, what's on your mind we'll get them again next week uh, we'll get at them again next week and our only regret is we can't get to all of them because they are so good but thanks Hey, James, no matter what's going on in the world, sometimes we just need to tune things out and get back in our zone. The best way we know how to do that is to put in some Raycon earbuds and play something we love. Whether you use them to pump up, wind down, work, or work out, Raycons are the go-to for on-the-go audio. And their new everyday earbuds look, feel, and sound better than ever. They have improved rubber oil look, they feel like they aren't even there, thanks to their optimized gel tips for the perfect in-ear fit. It feels good even before you hit play, but when you do, Raycon now has three new sound profiles, so you'll get just the right amount of bass. 
They have pure mode for podcast listening, blues, and instrumentals. Balance mode for more podcast, rock, heavy rock, and metal. And bass mode for hip-hop, EDM, or reggae. And when you're working, and this is the one we love, there's also an all-new awareness mode for when you need to listen to what's going on around you, too. Raycons offer eight hours of playtime and a 32-hour battery life with a built-in mic so you can take calls in your earbuds at the press of a button. Right, James? You know, this, this product violates one of my absolute rules in life. If something is too good to be true, then it's not true. All right? And I, I think if anybody comes with you with an investment product or any product, and it sounds like, nah, this can't be right. This violates that rule. It actually is as good as it sounds. <laughs> and that very few, that's the toughest bar to overcome. In, in, in my opinion, and I, I've kind of lived with that rule most of my life, and it's been pretty successful with me, but congratulations to these people. You, you've violated one of the real rules of my life. Okay, right on Raycons. It start at half the price of other premium auto brands and sound just as good, plus Raycons come with a 45-day happiness guarantee. Right now, Politics War Room listeners can get 15% off their Raycon orders at buyraycon.com slash warroom. That's buyraycom.com slash warroom to save 15% on Raycons. Again, buyraycon.com slash warroom or look for the link in our show notes. Hey, now for the outrage of the week. I have so many, I'm going to just get into three of them. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is offering police officers 5000 bucks. Uh, if they come to the state, if they haven't been vaccinated. Uh, so Santa says, boy, look how good Florida is doing on COVID. No, you're not. You done. You did well for a couple of weeks. But you have, over the course of this, a much higher rate of both incidents and deaths than California or New York. I mean, I guess the POS come to Florida, you police officers are unvaccinated. Your odds of dying are better. My second one is Donald Trump Jr. A terrible tragedy occurred in New Mexico when that, that brilliant young cine photographer was killed. Uh, when a, a gun was loaded, was accidentally given to Alec Baldwin. And, of course, what did Donald Trump Jr. do? He just immediately said, guns don't kill people, Alec Baldwin does. To, to seize on and to celebrate a tragedy like that for political gain just shows that Trump inherited his father's genes. And finally, it's the NFL commissioner, Roger Goodell, who continues to cover up a report on the toxic environment and, and sexual abuse that took place with the Washington football team. He thinks the public doesn't have a right to know as the owner, Dan Snyder, continues to basically go unpunished for this. If you care at all about transparency, pressure Roger Goodell. James. So, actually, I have a, a, a good news story. Uh, today, uh, I'm at Tulane School of Public Health at the request of the great John Barry, who's on the faculty there. And a the neighbor uh, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be interviewing a, a, a author by the name of Pam Fessler, and Pam has a book out, and the title is called Carville's Cure. It, it actually doesn't have anything to do with me. I quoted in it, and that's about it. It, it is about the place that I grew up and about the remarkable history of Carville, Louisiana, with reference to the center for the treatment of Hansen's disease, or better known as leprosy. And, and I read this book, and just think back of what the remarkable place, what a remarkable place that I grew up in, and didn't even realize it at the time. It's now, it's been close since to, to, to treating Hansen's patients since 1994, and it's the Louisiana National Guard has it, and I'm here to tell you that they're keeping it in excellent condition. You will learn so much in this book. And the thing that sort of struck me that I knew and I never really thought about it is how many influential and strong females that were associated with Carville, Louisiana. And her, her story is really interesting because her husband's grandfather – was actually a patient at Carville, and she's an experienced journalist. She was 28 years at, at NPR, and this is just a, a, not just saying it because it's about my hometown, I'm saying that this is a remarkably reported book uh, that just brought back so many memories of my childhood and, and taught me so much history about 
Carville that I didn't know. I, I couldn't recommend this book highly enough. And if any of you out there are interested, I, I'm pretty sure if you go to the site for uh, Tulane School of Public Health, which is quite good, by the way, uh, that it'll, it'll probably be streaming. But I, you will want to hear from Pam, and you'll want to hear the story. And I guarantee you, you, you will find this book to be fascinating. Boy, that's an inspirational uplift. We needed that, James. And uh, everybody... Uh, ought, to, ought, to, ought to read that book. And uh, when, when is your forum, James? It's today at 5 o'clock Central, so it'll be right. 6. At, um, the, the jacket blurbs are, are David Marinus, uh, Ron Klain, E.J. Dion, uh, Susan Stramberg, uh, the, uh, Meredith Wartman, who is the science magazine reporter and author of vaccine race and, and the jacket blurbs are unbelievable and the book is is just compelling it, it it it's an easy read and boy you you will you will see some some great stories the story of joseph joy guerrero is like one of the greatest stories ever told i'm, I'm gonna just take a point of privilege here to tell you that. so pre-world war ii manila was a first of all it was a gorgeous city in colonial architecture and it, it, of course, the Japanese destroyed it. And, and it, they had a social structure that, a lot like New Orleans. If you were in the 1%, you had a hell of a life. And, uh, and Joey Guerrero was actually a debutante. Her father was a very prominent, uh, I think he was an investment banker or something like that. It doesn't matter. And she contracted leprosy and became disfigured. And the Japanese, with such horrible racists and horrible, you know, thought people disfigured. And what they found out is that she could get through any Japanese sentry point. They just let her throw it in one fool one. And she carried messages to the Amer back and forth for American troops. And when the war was over, the, the, the troops, I mean, I'm talking about the E-4s and E-5s. This wasn't General MacArthur, Admiral Nimitz, or, or, or John C. Marshall, anything like that. They passed a hat and gave her the money to go to Carville to be treated. And she lived her days out there. And President Truman in 1948 awarded her the Presidential Medal of Freedom. I mean, that, that's what a big deal that Joey Guerrero was. And that's just one of the stories about remarkable females that, that were at Carville. And, and I, I urge everybody to read this book because to, I, I just think of what a effect it had on me Growing up in a place like that. Tell us the name with, of it again, James. Like it's called Carville's Cure. Okay, Carville's and Cure. It's, and it's Leprosy, Stigma, and the Fight for Justice by Pam Fessler. F-E-S-S-L-E-R. Okay. And it should be on the 6 o'clock Eastern, 5 Central, Good. Tulane School of Public Health. Put it on your reading list. Yes, sir, for sure. And we'll try to get Pam on the show at some point because the stories in there are just too compelling to, to believe. Hey, thanks for listening to Politics War Room with James Carvel and I'm Al Heim. Don't forget to send your questions for us by email to politicswarroom at gmail.com or tweet them for next week's show at Politicon. Following this episode, we'd really appreciate it if you check out the link to our sponsor, Raycon, in the show notes. We really thank you for supporting them. When you do, it helps make this podcast happen. To keep up with us, subscribe to Politics War Room on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. Please rate the show with a five-star review. We'll be back next week with another show as we continue our War Room planning.